Whatever rots your socks, whatever spins your top Whatever winds your watch, whatever flips your flop Whatever turns you on, whatever flies your flag Whatever bangs your gong or whatever swings your bag Do it often but do it well Cause nobody knows and there's no way to tell When the ride ends Hi, welcome back to Turtle Beach. It's uh, Ginje. It's the vegetarian festival this time of year. I'm going to miss most of it because Monday I go in for hernia surgery. Uh, so I came out tonight. It hasn't started yet, but as you can see, they're decorating the Am San Chao, the, the, the town square. Uh, what used to be uh, in the beginning of the industrial age, the town square. Now I've heard different uh, ages for that tree there, but there's a very old black and white photo. This over here is the museum, the Turtle Beach Museum, which is only open during the, the Turtle Festival every year. And over here are the seats for the nine emperor gods. And they will be carried down to the ocean on the first day of the festival, which is Saturday, I think. And uh, blessed at the ocean and then carried back up here and installed. And the festival can begin with walking over hot coals and beating yourself with sticks and whips and blades. And I imagine the, the Chinese opera is a little loud, so I'm gonna move away from it. It's all in transition right now, and I'm wearing Ginje White. Not going to make the same mistake I made last year, standing in the middle of the crowd. This whole square fills up. There's like a thousand or two thousand people for most evenings of the thing. Uh, shoulder to shoulder, every single person dressed in white, except Steve last year was dressed in a black shirt, standing in the middle of the crowd, holding his selfie stick up in the air. Yeah, fit in, Steve, assimilate. So anyway, I'm gonna move away from the Chinese opera. I'm gonna let you know what we're doing this week. Uh, a man named Roy Bott produced a short film based on a story I wrote, I think, for a magazine 20 years ago. And it was shot, directed by uh, James Newman. And it is available <clears throat> right now on James's, uh, see that would have been me. The kids playing uh, on a dark stage. That was Steve growing up. And that's why Steve spent a lot of years waiting tables. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so this is the Am San Chao, the, the, the uh, uh, the temple back there, the Taoist temple is uh, uh, San Chao, and the Am is any plaza, any open space, open civic space. As far as I know, I'm sure Steve, will, somebody will correct me. Anyway, James Newman uh, directed this six minute movie based on an old short story by Steve Ross. I didn't have anything to do with it. Uh, I went to Bangkok for the uh, premiere and uh, loved it. Absolutely loved it. James did a fantastic job on this thing. Uh, the actor in the lead role did a fantastic job. <clears throat> I loved everything about it. And it was held at a place called The Tavern up in Bangkok. And I flew to Bangkok specifically to attend this six minute premiere. And uh, the tavern, it was Taco Tuesday at the tavern. So I ate tacos and I got attention from strangers and everybody liked the movie. So I'm gonna, James has given me permission to use it here. I'm gonna use it here, but if you like it, even if you don't, go over to Strange TV, that is James's channel, Strange TV. He creates uh, under the nom de guerre, nom de plume, uh, JD Strange. So Strange TV, go over there, give him a like, a subscribe, and a share, will ya? Uh, he did really good work on this. <clears throat> and I'm very grateful to him and Roy Bott. Uh, and Richie Moore, I think was the name of the DP, uh, I hope. And uh, he did tr tremendous work. Uh, everything's in focus. Anyway, so that's what this week is gonna be. Uh, I wanna do a few, few things first. I don't know what next week's gonna be because like I said, Monday morning, I'm having hernia repair surgery. 
to know how that's gonna go. <clears throat> well, I know how it's gonna go. It's the most common surgery performed anywhere in the world. Uh, that and C-section, I think are number one and two. Anyway, uh, yeah, so next week, I don't know, we may skip a week or, or it may be Steve dressed in white again in a hospital bed, you never know. Uh, but since we're on the theme of movies, I wanted to uh, uh, tell you a movie story. All right. So I was shooting Heaven and Earth, uh, directed by Oliver Stone, and I ended up working six months on that movie as lead set dresser. And this is the story of the day I showed Oliver Stone my nutsack. So we, the first six weeks of production, pre-production, we uh, uh, built a faux Vietnamese village in Panga Province out in the middle of the rice fields. <clears throat> Excuse me, there was a town center and a temple and a bunch of houses. And the thing had, done, had been done by aerial survey of the actual Vietnamese village that the author of the book that we were filming, uh, Heaven and Earth, Hip Tay Lee, she had grown up in this village in Vietnam and the story takes place, much of it in this village. So Oliver Stone recreated it house by house, rock by rock carp pond by carp pond, uh, dike by dike. He recreated it out in the middle of the rice paddies. And we worked for six weeks on that son of a bitch and we did terrific work. It was a great piece of work. And uh, so after six weeks, the shooting crew is gonna show up, Oliver Stone and the cast and all the important people. And we in the art department are excited as hell because he's gonna come and see the work that we've spent six weeks doing. And we're all excited, right? So the thing was built in the rice paddies, right? The whole village was out in the rice paddies. So you got from place to place, you got from the temple to the village, the village to Hip Tay Lee's house, or Hip Tay Lee's house to the production office, or the art department office, or motor pool, or wherever you had to go, on dikes, the, the, the dirt walls that are between the rice paddies. And these things were probably six feet wide and four feet deep and you couldn't drive a car on them. So the company bought a hundred bicycles and everybody in the art department had spent six weeks riding all over this place on the dikes between the paddies on bicycles. So after six weeks, I'm out there, I'm riding on a dike on a bicycle and here comes this crowd of people walking toward me on the dike. So I'm, we're face to face and I see this big tall guy in the middle of the crowd. I think that's Oliver Stone. And uh, he's here, he's gonna see the work. So I stopped the bike and I put one foot down on the ground and kept one foot over the frame of the bike. So I'm kind of like, you know, spread open. As you do on a bicycle, you straddle a bicycle, right? So you stop, you put one foot down, you keep one foot on a pedal and your, your, your knee is cocked and you're kind of, uh, you know, wide open. And this crowd is coming toward me, about six or eight people, and they're all looking at me with horror. Absolutely aghast. Like they can't believe what they're seeing. And I'm standing there alone in the middle of these rice paddies on this bicycle going, what, what are they looking at? What's wrong? And they get close enough to me to speak to them. And I said, Mr. Stone, hi, I'm Steve Ross. I'm lead set dresser. And whoosh, he goes past me. He doesn't make eye contact. He doesn't look at me. Everybody's going past me. And in the crowd, I notice a woman named uh, Chitra Mojtabai, an Iranian woman who uh, we had worked together on a movie about five years before this in Virginia. And I said, Chitra, Chitra, it's Steve. And that woman, her face just went like, she ducked, right? She like did not want to be associated with me. And I couldn't figure out why. Well, it turns out I had been wearing these cheap cotton fisherman pants you buy everywhere because you're always covered with paint and sawdust and mud and we're stringing barbed wire in the rice paddies. It's 100 degrees, 100% humidity, you're hot as hell. These are the most comfortable pants you can buy, but they're very cheaply made and every now and then a seam will pop out on you. And in this instance, on that bicycle, on that day, without me, uh, you gotta work on your timing, boys. Without me, being aware of it, my pants had split open and my nutsack was hanging out there like a wad of pink chewing gum. And because you don't really feel these pants, they're so light 
you don't really feel these pants when you're wearing them. I hadn't realized that I'm hanging out there and I had just exposed myself to the entire production crew of this movie, which would have been Oliver Stone, the director of photography, first assistant director, second assistant director, which was Chitra's job, uh, probably someone from hair and makeup, someone from construction. And there's Steve standing there with a big grin on his face, trying to introduce himself to the director with his nuts hanging out of his pants. Uh, I got over it, <laughs> but uh, you know, people ask me, oh, who'd you work with in the movie industry? Well, it doesn't matter. I work with a lot of big stars. None of them would ever remember me. It doesn't matter if they don't remember you. It doesn't matter that you remember them. But if you would, uh, Jodie Foster, cause I hit her in the head with a cardboard box and made her head bleed. She'd remember Steve Ross. Uh, I gave Holly Hunter hives. She would remember Steve Ross. And uh, yeah, Oliver Stone would remember Steve Ross. All right, so that's my movie story. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your time. Uh, I really love you guys. I do, man. This is the best day of my week. I love doing this. And I really wish I could, you know, do the Ginge this year. But you can go back a year ago. I was out here with this selfie stick all nine days. And there are old videos on the channel if you want to go look. It. And it's the same thing for 175 years. Been the same thing every year. Isn't that lovely? Look at that old tree. I'm gonna go to the, I'm gonna try to get to the uh, uh, museum. There's a picture of that tree from about 1904 and it's the same size it is now. Uh, I'm gonna try to figure out exactly how old that tree is. Anyway, enjoy the movie. Again, much, much love to James and Roy. And uh, next time I speak to you, uh, hopefully I will be healing and uh, not in danger of my uh, intestines falling into my uh, scrotum anymore. I've had enough scrotum drama. All right, that's it. Thank you, enjoy the movie. I love you guys, don't ever change. Like, subscribe, share. Did I forget anything? Uh, thank you to John Armstrong for the stickers. Thank you to Bruce Scott for the camera equipment. Uh, uh, thank you to the Tavern for hosting us and you have great tacos at the Tavern. There's Soy 4, Sook Soy 4, just down the road from Nana. Oh, and thank you to Maddie. Ha, ah, I'm gonna tell you this real quick. After the premiere, Maddie took me to a uh, go-go bar and I haven't really spent any time in a go-go bar in 30 years. But Maddie has come all the way from America. He's retired, he's in his first month of retirement and he swears Nana Plaza is his turtle beach. And, uh, he said, after the movie, let me take you out and, uh, you know, we'll go to a go-go bar. I said, fine, you buy me a strawberry Fanta and a pack of cigarettes, I'll go with you to the go-go bar. And we went to the go-go bar and he had this big wad of 20s. And he said, uh, here, here, take half these 20s and go stick them in the young lady's uh, underwear. And I thought, well, there's a portrait of the king on uh, every bill. I don't know if that's appropriate. I, as always, I watched the Thai people to see their reaction. And these young ladies were happy as hell to have us stick these 20 baht notes in their underwear. And so I did that. You know what? It was fun. Ha! It was the first thing I did. I think that other than watching that movie, uh, the first absolutely riotous, joyous fun uh, in a go-go bar. Who could have imagined it? Steve Ross had fun in a go-go bar. Uh, so I thank Maddie from Patty for that very much. And uh, yeah, I think that's it. Uh, probably other people to thank. I'm forgetting, I'm sorry. But enjoy the movie. I'll see you in a week. Thank you very much for your time and your attention. who found their turtle beach a long, long time before I did.
There will be no boondongs tonight. It's a, gone in a moment. Gone in a moment. Gone in a moment. Gone in a moment. All right. Meet Melvin. This year he's a military man. He's telling us his story, and every single word of it is a lie. We had only seconds to spare to save the Turkish soldier. I had to act fast. The airplane was on fire. All the passengers were at risk. So I ran in there. I grabbed him. I pulled him out of there. I saved him. I saved everybody that day. I don't know what Melvin's real name is. He's used several names in the time I've known him, and I'm certain none of them are the name he was born with. I call him Melvin because he looks like a Melvin. He's lumpy, jowly, boarding, stoop-shouldered and splay-footed. <laughs> a real Melvin. The first time I met Melvin, he told me he owned a catering company that supplied the craft service tables backstage at rock concerts. He had all kinds of interesting stories about which rock stars preferred what kind of cold meat sandwiches. Did I tell you about Brian Adams? You won't believe what that schmuck wanted on his Reuben on Rye. Fennel. Can you believe it? Fresh. Fennel! <laughs> uh, but we're best buddies. He even gave me one of his guitars. Autographed it too. Great guy, Brian. Two years ago, Melvin turned up in town again. And this time he had a different name and he was living off a million dollar settlement he got after being injured on an amusement park roller coaster. You know the cyclone in Coney Island? I flew straight out of the bench seat and into the mountains. One million cool ones. Out of port settlement. So now it's a tradition. Every summer, Melvin spends a month in Bangkok, and every year he's a different guy. The third year, he was a private detective. I'm looking for a girl. She went missing in these parts around about Christmas last year. Do you know this woman? I guess I'm a different guy every time he meets me too. I've never used any name except my own name, but since he isn't interested in anybody but himself, I make no impression on him. Melvin has met me for the first time four times. All across the world, there are guys like Melvin. Guys who want desperately to be somebody other than themselves. The bars in Bangkok offer a perfect venue for being somebody else. Everybody's a stranger, and everybody's just killing time. So nobody asks too many questions. Everybody is hiding something, so everyone just lives on the surface of things. But what's it like knowing the moment is coming? The moment must come for all of us, all of these guys, the moment they have to be themselves again. Maybe the moment comes when they have to present a passport with their real name on it to border control on the way home at the airport. 
Maybe it comes when the taxi rolls up to their front door, or when they step inside and see the pile of month-old mail addressed to their real name. Maybe some of them can hold off the moment until they get back to the office and the phone rings and suddenly they have to answer. Somewhere, somehow, someplace, the moment must come and it must be as certain and as unwelcome as death. The moment when they have to resume being the guy they hate. You know, that guy who never lived up to his potential. The guy with the unsatisfactory career and the failed relationships. The guy who never gets invited when everybody else in the office goes out for pizza on Fridays. The guy with the stamp collection or the model aeroplanes. Hobbies that can be practiced at home alone. The guy with the freezer full of frozen meals for one. It's romantic to eat alone in a dirty restaurant on the back alley in Beijing. Eating alone in Pasadena is pathetic. What's it like knowing that moment is coming? Does Melvin sit in dread through the whole flight home, knowing that the moment is barreling towards him at 600 miles an hour? How much time is invested, daydreaming of the other guy's life, coming up with all the convincing little details that make the other guy's life so interesting, all the hard work and imagination, gone forever without any record that it ever existed, a work of art really, destroyed in an instant, on one side of the moment a hero, on the other side a zero. <laughs> Hey buddy, is this seat taken? Is it okay if I sit here? No, no, that's fine. You can sit there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No worries. It's a nice camera you got there. Are you working here? Yeah, I'm working here. I just got off a um, a shoot. I was just shooting a music video for uh, Brian Adams, and uh, and you never believe what he likes on his Reuben and Rye sandwiches. Fennel, can you believe it? <laughs> Fresh fennel. 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 Shoot down to that damn door. 